back in Acts 21 for this message. And I, uh, for some reason, I didn't make a slide for the passage. So I think we will, uh, you might want to open your Bibles to Acts 21, and we'll read that passage again, the first bit of it. And as I mentioned, we're reversing the order. So what we're going to do, we dealt with part two of the passage this morning, and part we'll do with part one this afternoon. And I've called this one, The Glorious Gentile Mission. Now, this material is a conclusion of Luke's travelogue to Jerusalem. Remember, we were all those place names. And, and it's very curious and interesting that Luke wants to include all this detail. You think, why? Why is it there? So we have tried to make some things out of it. And then in, in this passage, there's the summation of Paul's report to the Jerusalem elders. There's, there's not much theology in this. There's no real narrative description, just a relatively terse account of all that Paul had to say, telling of the work, his work in the Roman Empire. And here comes that bus, so uh, I want to get that organized. So in this message, I don't have much exhortation, but the passage, passage does speak to the glory of God. So our objective is to join with Christians across the centuries and lift up our voices in praise to God for his gracious work among men. So let's read the passage. I want to begin in um, Acts 21, verse 15, and I'm going to read to the beginning of verse 20. After these days we got ready and started on our way up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea also came with us, taking us to Nason of Cyprus, a disciple of long standing with whom we were to lodge. After we arrived in Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. After he, he had greeted them, he began to relate one by one the things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they began glorifying God. So that's our passage for this message. And uh, we are going to talk about, first of all, a prelude, a host with Gentile connections. So we have the travel from, Jeru uh, from Caesarea to Jerusalem. It's about 62 miles from Caesarea to Jerusalem. The word that is used in verse 15 uh, suggests saddling up or loading pack horses. When you see, after these days, we got ready and started. So that got ready suggests, according to the commentaries, that they were using horses. So if by horse, the journey might last two days. A group of Caesareans are, are uh, accompanying them. Perhaps they are going down to, or going, I'm saying going down, Notice the text says, on our way up to Jerusalem. Now, Caesarea is northwest of Jerusalem. So in our reckoning, that would be down, right? We'd say, you're going down to Jerusalem. But for the Jews, if you're going to Jerusalem, you're going up. If you're going away from Jerusalem, you're going down. It doesn't matter what direction you're going. If you're going away from Jerusalem, it's down. That's just the way it is. Okay, so if you're going towards Jerusalem, it's up. Anyway, so they were going up to Jerusalem. And uh, perhaps, there, it, it says a group of Caesareans, disciples from Caesarea, accompanied them. Perhaps they were also going because it was the Passover season. Remember, that's why Paul wanted to get to Jerusalem. Or perhaps they were there to lead them to, the ho to their host. And you'll notice this host. See that name? Isn't that a great name? This is the only place in the Bible where he occurs. Nason. Right? That's a very Greek name, in case you were wondering. It's not you know, Jedediah or you know, Zechariah or something like that. That's a Hebrew name. This is a Greek name. Now, he's, it's, he's described as a disciple of long standing. How long? Well, some suggest as far back as Pentecost. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. Uh, and he is from Cyprus. So he is at least a Hellenized Jewish Christian. What does that mean? That means that he uh, lived and grew up in a Greek area, Cyprus. Okay? He was surrounded by Greeks. So he, if he was a Jew, he was a Hellenized Jew, somebody who was raised in a Greek culture. When they came to Jerusalem, there was a distinction. We talked about that this morning a little bit. There's a distinction between the Hellenized Jews and the Jewish Jews, if you follow my meaning. All right? So uh, he could have been actually, a Gentile. 
It's possible he was a Gentile. But uh, the, at least he was a Hellenized Jewish Christian. He was a Christian. So he's going to host Paul and his cohort of mostly Gentiles, and that seems a logical choice. So if he is at least a Hellenized Jew as a Christian, he is more open to interaction with Gentiles than the Jews who are Judean Jews in Jerusalem might be. So with these introductory words, we find ourselves now in Jerusalem. Uh, he's got the trappings of his Gentile connections all around him. This is, as we mentioned, a sore spot for the Jews, uh, and including the Jewish Christians, as noted this morning. So he goes in, he meets with uh, the um, apostles, or not the apostles, with the elders. All right, so let's see. It says, the brethren received us gladly in verse 17. And then it says in verse 18, And the following day Paul went in with us to James and all the elders who were, pre were present. So this is, James is the brother of Jesus, as I mentioned, physical brother. And then he, uh, but he became, he's the one who wrote the epistle of James. He's well known in the church. He was a leader in the church in Jerusalem. All right, uh, let's see. Verse uh, 19, after he had greeted them, he began to relate one by one the things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. So I wonder about this. How long did this meeting last? If he was telling them everything, how long did this last? Uh, was it all three journeys that he was talking about or just the last one? Probably, I'm thinking, just the last run. But I want to take some time to go through the record of Paul's mission. So I'm going to give you some slides. We've, I've shown you some of these before. Oh, it's not on. Oh, sorry. I, was, I, was all, I knew there was something missing. You see, I'm getting old. You have to help me. Shout at me and keep me on track. All right, so I'm going to give you a slide here of the first missionary journey. And you see, I think, well enough, that looks pretty good. You see the... Um, the red arrows, where they take off from Antioch, they go through Cyprus. That's where Nason, what a name, that's just an awesome name. That, uh, they go through Cyprus, uh, and then they go to Perga. You see that on the map? They go up to Pisidian, Antioch. They go over to Iconium, over to Lystra, and then to Derbe. Remember, he was st Paul was stoned in Lystra. Uh, and then... Uh, this map, the second map doesn't show it. It shows those cities, but they made their way back through all those cities, and it says in Acts that they, were they appointed elders in every church, or pastors, and then it takes them down to the coast at Perga. They take ship and go back to Antioch that way. So that's the first missionary journey. All right, now I got one for the second missionary journey. And you'll notice where he goes. He goes by land this time. And notice, he goes through Derby, Lystra, Iconium, Antioch. And it, he goes all the way up to Troas. And up in that region, he was wanting to go to Asia. Where was that? Ephesus. He, didn't, he wanted to go to Asia, but the Holy Spirit said no. So where should we go? And in Troas, they had the Macedonian vision. Come over to Macedonia and help us. So Macedonia, you have the city names, Neapolis, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea. Those are all Macedonian cities. So Paul went and preached in all those cities, and there's all kinds of stories about what happened there. There was the jailing in, in uh, Philippi and the earthquake that, that uh, released them, and then the conversion of the Philippian jailer and all of those stories, and the persecution in Thessalonica, and then the good response in Berea, but then the Thessalonican Jews came and caused more trouble, and so Paul went down to Athens. And from Athens, he went over to Cor uh, Corinth. That was the first missionary journey, uh, second missionary journey. And then from Corinth, he sailed across with Aquila and Priscilla to Ephesus, was there just for a very short time, and then he sailed back to Caesarea. All right, so that's the uh, second missionary journey. But think of all those cities that he went through. Think of all the people he met, all the stories we know about things that happened as we experience all this. And then we have the third missionary journey. And again, he goes over land, Derby, Lystra, Iconium, Antioch. Third visit. Goes then to Ephesus. He spends two and a half to three years in Ephesus. Goes up to Troas, then to Macedonia. 
uh, and all the way back down to Corinth again. And then he turns around and he comes back pretty much the same way, except he sails from Troas all the way down, as you see, Miletus. That's where that long sermon in Acts 20 took place. And then he goes uh, to Patera, catches the ship to Tyre, on the way down to uh, Caesarea, and then to Jerusalem at the very end. And you'll see all of those locations. So all of these things, and we've covered all the stories of the things that happened and in all of this. In a little under 10 years, oh, I didn't give you the dates for all of those. First missionary journey, about A.D. 49 to 50, a couple years. And then the second missionary journey, roughly 51 to 54. Okay, And then the third journey, from 54 to about 56 or 57. That's when Paul ended up arrested in Jerusalem in 57. So it's roughly in those dates. Now there's different, some commentaries in that will give you a slightly different date, but those are roughly what the dates are. But I ran across a website that calculated the miles. He also calculated the cost in denarii. I don't, I don't know. I thought, this, is, this guy is a little bit obsessive. But anyway, he uh, calculated the distance that Paul traveled. First missionary journey, 1,581 miles. Okay? And the travel days, calculating, they're calculating the type of travel by ship and by foot, and then also... Uh, uh, you know, the, the various uh, time, uh, uh, the amount of time that would be necessary to walk that far or to sail that far. All right, so that's how he calculated these days. So he's calculating 53 days of travel for that first journey. Second journey, 3,050 miles, 100 travel days. Okay, 100 travel days. And then the third journey, 3,307 miles, but only 92 travel days because of all that sailing by ship. Okay, so then I got to thinking about that. Total days, based on my rough estimates about the dates. For two years, 730 days. So 53, days, 53 of those days were travel days. Think about the number of days Paul had to preach. Now we have, how many cities in that first journey? Well, we have Cyprus. There's a couple cities mentioned there, from one end of Cyprus to the other. Then Perga, Pisidian, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derby. I've got six names there. Cyprus, let's make it seven. So we've got two cities named, I think, in Cyprus. All right. Seven cities named. 1,500 miles traveled. 53 of those days are travel days, 730 days. I think he, he may have stayed in some of those cities for a little while. But he was preaching all over the place. When we're to, when we, what we have in Acts is very much the highlights, the, the parts that Luke and the Holy Spirit wants us to know. And the same thing, notice for the others. The second journey, I, by my calculation, this could be off a little bit, but I'm saying about 1,277 days and 100 days of travel time. That leaves 100, or 1,177 days for preaching, right? for evangelizing. Now, he was probably, while he was traveling, he was preaching to whoever would listen as well. And again, third journey. And we know he spent a lot of that time in Ephesus. And I talked about how, when we were in that section, Paul, uh, not only Paul's influence, Paul's work in Ephesus, there were people who were one to the Lord and went down to Colossae. And Epaphras is the fellow that's mentioned in Colossians. And he... Uh, it seems like he was the guy who came, brought the gospel to Colossae and started the church there, and the one in Laodicea, which is not too far away. And so, so uh, this is all due to Paul's influence. And the point I'm making here is that we have a real remarkable, remarkable uh, thing to think about in Paul's missionary journeys. Uh, how many events does Luke leave out of his record? How many did Paul leave in as he rehearsed the story in Jerusalem? You know, there's things surely happened. Surely there were miracles that occurred. Surely there were significant converts in every city, in places that were sometimes they could have been just a little hamlet, a little village, and somebody there received the Lord as their Savior and began to 
meet together. It's really a remarkable story. And I, uh, and I think about this again. There's another thing to think about this. Uh, we, we see the remarkable transformation in the life of Saul. Remember? Saul the persecutor, Saul the Pharisee, Saul the antagonist of Christ. He meets Jesus in the Damascus Road in Acts chapter 9, and everything changes. Right? He becomes the great preacher of the gospel. All right, now think about these people, these Gentiles that he has met in all these cities as he's going uh, through all of this. And think about the kind of lives they led. Now, um, you know, they're living in the pagan Roman Empire. Their lives are full of idols and idol worship. They are, uh, some of the practices that they follow are, are very uh, immoral in their religion and then immoral in their daily life. Things that, that was nothing to them. And then comes the gospel and teaches them the truth in the Lord Jesus Christ and teaches them, as uh, we saw well, I see down there in verse 25, teaching the Gentiles to abstain from meat offered to idols, from blood and from what is strangled and from fornication, a very big problem in the Roman Empire. The moral uh, climate was, was very loose, I'd have to say. Uh, just... I don't even want to get into it to describe it, but you read up on it and you will find out what kinds of lives that people uh, lived in those days. Uh, and now they come to Christ. Here comes this gospel. Remember how the Jews thought about the Gentiles and you know the dogs of the Gentiles. You have that phrase I think Paul uses in, the, in Philippians. I think is where he uses it. And they are they were. The Jews looked at the Gentiles as just unclean, unclean in their practices, unclean in their worship. You're unclean in their souls, just people that, that you don't even want to have anything to do with. That was entirely the wrong perspective from what God had commissioned the Jews to do. They were to proclaim God's truth. They were to be priests of God before the people. And so now here is the new covenant. Here is the Lord Jesus Christ. Here he is sending out his apostles. And they are bringing a message that not only transforms but cleanses the lives of these people who, we have to say, they were unclean. And that's the same message for us. Without Christ, we are unclean before God. We are under God's uh, condemnation. But when we receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, God forgives our sins. He makes us new on the inside. He gives us the Holy Spirit to lead, to guide, to convict, to point us to the truth of the gospel, to the truth of the Christian way of life, and our whole life is transformed. The glorious Gentile mission. This is what Paul is rehearsing before these uh, men. Now, the last thing I want to consider here is the reception. Gladness and glory. I touched on verse 17. After we arrived in Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. I'm going to take this to be the church at large. Now, there was an undercurrent, as we said, amongst some of them, that, well, we're not sure about Paul, and we dealt with that this morning. But at large, the general reception, the people received them gladly. And then he, they go in, and Paul rehearses this story. And it says, James and the elders began glorifying God, in verse 20. They're just, they're having a revival meeting. What a wonderful thing. What wonderful stories to hear about how people have come to Christ and, to, and how their lives have been chained, changed. When Paul talks about that demon-possessed girl in Philippi who was uh, uh, possessed by an unclean spirit and then Paul cast out the spirit and then she becomes a part of that believing church. What a remarkable change. What a tremendous difference. The Philippian jailer. He's, you know, he's an ex-Roman soldier, probably. He was probably a brutal man. God changed him and made him a part of that church. And there's Lydia, the seller of purple, a very wealthy woman who also is changed by the gospel. What stories. What a remarkable uh, power the gospel has. What a glorious mission the apostle had. And it summed up in a way, in a passage, there's several passages I could turn to, but in Ephesians 2, 
verses 1 through 8, there is something that I think sums up what this mission meant in the lives of the people who received it. Ephesians 2, verse 1, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Now, I'm not 100% certain. I'm just going to pause here for a second. But he says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. He's writing to his readers in Ephesus, mostly Gentiles. But look, he says, among them, we too, we Jews also, were, who formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh. Yes, they were following the God of the Old Testament, but they were following it in their flesh. And he says, we were in darkness. And then comes verse 4, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Isn't it remarkable? I've heard a sermon, a very, very famous sermon that Martin Lloyd-Jones uh, preached. I don't remember when the date was. I've read about it in his biography. It is noted, uh, Ian Murray wrote an excellent biography of uh, Lloyd-Jones, and, uh, and they mention this sermon. And some years ago, I found that many of his sermons were recorded in audio, and you could download them. And back then, you had to pay that for them. Now you can get them for free. He had, this sermon is called, But God. And it's on those two verses in ver words in verse 4. But God. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. But God. Okay? You, you were walking according to to the course of this world, but God. You are walking according to the prince of the power of the air. You are following the leadership of Satan, but God. Of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, but God. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, but God. You see, that's the difference, and that's the message that Paul had for the elders in, uh, in, in Jerusalem. Here's what we've done. Here's what God has done. Here's the people. Let me tell you about uh, this fellow I met over in, in Antioch of Pisidia. Let me tell you about this man who was in Troas. Let me tell you about Eutychus. <laughs> you know, Eutychus you know, falls out of the window in the sermon. He said, you're not getting away from me that easy. You know, bring him back up and make him listen to the rest of it. All right? There's... There's so much, but, but God has been involved in changing these lives. The glorious, glorious Gentile mission. That is an incredible, incredible story. And, you know, the passage doesn't tell us much, but it has these little hints. We think back to what Paul has accomplished in this missionary journey, about nine years. Not much more than that. And the thousands of people who are impacted by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that impact was multiplied. Now, you go through church history, some of the things that happened were, were really strange. There were people who would uh, meet up, and it became a political thing to become a Christian. And the king would say, okay, I'm going to be a Christian now. Okay, all you soldiers, you're converted. You're all going to convert. You know, say, you, you know, whatever. They'd turn them into Christians just like that. Now, that doesn't seem to me as a very legitimate way of evangelism. Right? I don't know about you. But you look at what God did. In spite of the foolishness of men, throughout all of history, we have the gospel reaching all the way from Jerusalem to Victoria, British Columbia. It's a remarkable thing to me that we too are a part of this body of people, this Gentile mission started by the Apostle Paul where he moved in our lives and turned our lives upside down. And we're walking with the Lord. And knowing the Holy Spirit and knowing the way of salvation, what a blessing it is.
I hope that it is true for each one of you that you know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you again for this time as we uh, consider the message of the mission of the Apostle Paul in all those months and years as he walked all over the Roman Empire preaching the gospel. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be people who are dedicated to giving that message out every way we can in our day, in our place in the world. And Lord, we pray that you will help us to find people who are willing to hear and they'll come and receive the Lord Jesus as their Savior. We pray these things in Jesus' name.